Hello everybody, I'm Robert Aducci for uh, Ulysses International and we're going to go over uh, the theater nights, the White Lake. Uh, this is an adventure for the dark eye and the reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, we just made an announcement yesterday on our Ulysses World show that uh, the new uh, Kickstarter crowdfunding for the dark eye for Gods of Aventuria is uh, going to happen in July. So. Um, keep an eye out for that and part of that Kickstarter is uh, there's going to be more of these adventures for, um, um, from the, the Theater Nights campaign and so um, I wanted to kind of read through it um, I have this PDF uh, I've also got the book um, the book is as usual for the Dark Eye and Ulysses stuff it looks really nice it's about um, uh, it's 68 pages um, full color um, it's got that spot varnish. I don't know if you can see that a little bit. Yeah, so it looks, you know, a lot or maybe even all of the um, Dark Eye books have that, and it just makes it look real nice. All these these books have really great production value. Um, but this is the um, the PDF, so we're gonna start reading through that. Hello, Planer Crossroads. Welcome to the chat. So I have not, I don't really have any experience with this, uh, with this adventure. I know it's uh, one of the kind of long running um, campaigns. There are three of these books out now. Um, and then, you know, there was obviously more in the German, um, German language. Uh, so we're gonna work on converting those for, uh, for the gods of Aventuria. And then um, there's also, uh, what was it? The Theater Knights, uh, let's see, what was the other one called? Um, Legacy of the Theater Knights, and I think that came out in um, with the Warring Kingdoms. No, that was in Magic of Aventuria, I guess. Uh, so that one just came out, and it kind of explain expands upon the Theater Knights campaign. So definitely check uh, check this out as well. It's called uh, Legacy of the Theater Knights. So, um, but let's just get into into reading this. Actually, let's let's look at the back. Let's see, what's the, oh, I guess it wasn't on there. Hold on. Just kind of read the, the little gist of the adventure here. There we go. So it says, uh, The White Lake, part one of the Theater Knights campaign by Daniel Heveler and Nicholas Freiter. As the first snowflakes of the season begin to fall in Bornland, an unarmed group an armed group sets out in search of the missing Thorwall drum, a symbol of pride and patriotism for the citizens of Festum. The drum was stolen last spring, and to get it back, guard captain Tim Timpsky and his men are more than willing to use force. The trail leads them to a larger, to a logger of Norband houseboats locked in the ice, and only the heroes are able to delay a brutal assault by the Timpsky band. Patimsky's band. The fragile situation is soon complicated by a blossoming romance between Jani and Brutish, who two literature loving goblins from Festum and Disaster Strikes. The first adventure in the Theater Knights campaign introduces important characters, races, and power blocks, and sets the stage for new developments in the history of the Bornland and the legendary order of the Theater Knights. This book includes all necessary supporting information, such as stats, maps, and floor plans. To play, you need the Dark Eye core rules, as well as Aventuria Al Almanac, which provides a deeper understanding of the setting. The White Lake may also be played as a standalone adventure. Um, I like this. Uh, I've seen this on um, some other adventures. Um, kind of gives a little bit of uh, details about where it is, um, what, kind of, kind of, what kind of adventures they are. So the genre, adventure story, prerequisites, negotiation, weather-resistant heroes, because there's chases in the mountains, locations, Festum, Bornorod, Bornrod, Hardner Lake, District, Red Sickle Mountains, date, late autumn, 1039 FB, complexity, for the players, it's medium, and for the GM, it's medium. Suggested hero experience is experienced. And some useful skills. So it's, uh, you know, medium high on social skills and nature skills and medium low on combat and living history. Nice. So that is uh, the overview. Let's see back to the beginning here. 
So if you're watching the stream, you can see the images that are in the bottom left there. Those are um, those are all going to they were some preview images that we had for Gods of Aventuria. So um, some of that might be new to you if you missed the stream yesterday. Uh, and if you want to catch that stream, we had um, Tayo Fitkow. He is the um, he is a line developer for the Dark Guy. So go check that out. It's the Ulysses World stream. You can get that on YouTube or you can see it in the notes um, on the website, ulysses-us.com. So let's see. This is uh, something I've noticed in um, in the Dark Eye. I really like all of this. It kind of walks you through sort of how the adventure is laid out, um, and what you can expect, like what all these things mean, which is which is cool. Uh, so I like all these little call outs. So once you get once you get used to them, then uh, they really help uh, seem to help speed up the game. So this is to make uh, the scene easier for the heroes, use the suggestion in this paragraph. So if there's this little green, I can't tell what that is, a potion maybe. And to make the scene more difficult for the heroes, use this suggestion in the paragraph, little red school. Then there's going to be read aloud text, GM information, rumors, and NPC stats. These boxes contain important information about the game. So... Uh, quality prices and beds. Taverns and inns are rated by levels associated with their quality price and beds. Quality indicates the establishment's overall condition. Price modifies the prices listed in the core rules for services and goods by the given percentage. And beds indicate the maximum number of beds. Nice. Uh, I like this. So uh, NPCs with this symbol play an important role in future official adventures. NPCs with this symbol hold a position that will provide prove important in future official adventures, but the character itself can be replaced with another one of your choosing. So this is like the the king, I guess, the knight, the pawn. NPCs with this adventure symbol do not appear in official adventures. In future official adventures, you can re reuse them freely in your campaigns and adventures. And then the rook. NPCs with this symbol are important to the campaign and will likely be in other official campaign books. You can easily replace them if the new character fulfills the same function. So I, I like this aspect because it lets you know, you know, <laughs> I've definitely run games where, you know, the players, um, characters killed a, a specific NPC and then later on you find out, oh, they were sort of important. So um, if you want to give it an NPC plot armor, you can do that with these, you know, kind of lets you know what you need to do or, you know, you know, you, you can easily swap them out. Um, and obviously if your PCs are going to do stuff, you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to react to it anyways regardless of uh, of this kind of stuff but uh but it's nice to have so you can like have that in the back of your mind um you know when the pcs are creating chaos like they like they normally do um so this is more about the 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 ins different kinds of ins the currency calculator it's a little translation all right so let's get into it so introduction the cowards escaped with goat and cart our of ours just 30 remained the goblins beat the drum to war but lionsford we claimed from the epic poem of course chosen aljosa of pilcrest about 200 fb so one of the things that um that tayo said was uh, uh the core vatamakum was going to be in um in this next uh, crowdfunding and uh, so it's going to you know talk talks about core and uh, the beliefs of of their blessed ones and whatnot. Then Orvai Kurim thrust his mighty tusks into the flesh of the Iron Man and ripped the skin from his bones in big bloody rags. And with his hot breath, Orvai Kurim melted the iron bones and forged them into a large bowl. And with his urine, Orvai Kurim bleached the torn skin and made it supple. And with his swift fingers, Orvai Kurim stretched the skin over the bowl to make a drum. And into the belly of the drum, Orvikurum spat all the rage and vengeance. Nakarakti awoke in him, and the Iron Men themselves shall suffer the horror they sought to bring to the Sulak. Myth of the Lungai Thaluzi, as told by Trinun Stonetooth. Modern. 
GM introduction. Greetings to the Twelve. In your hands you hold the White Lake, the first of six adventures in an exciting new campaign for the Dark Eye, surrounding the legacy of the Theater Knights in the Bornland and the search for their legend for the legendary goblin Timble. These adventures are designed for sequential play, but you can also play each as a standalone adventure or even omit an adventure from the campaign. To simplify this, we mark important elements with the following symbol. It's like the lion rampant. Many of these elements appear in successive adventures, so it's a good idea to write down the outcome of these encounters. Some of the player's decisions will have significant consequences for the scenario, as the heroes are at the center of the action. Important characters such as Ludara of Faerunmin, the Blessed One of Rondra, appear throughout the campaign, lending additional cohesion to the story. Campaign Background Full of spells and secrets, the Bjornland is a wild primal landscape. Nearly a thousand years ago, the immortal high queen of the Goblin Empire, Kunga Sula, was overthrown in a long, bloody battle by the Rondran Order of the Theater of Arivor. Legend says the cruel demigod Kor manifested in the end to lead the Theater Knights to victory, and that Rondra's son played a part in conquering the Goblin's power center, uh, Jasula. To this day, Bornean noble families trace their heritage back to the theater knights, but despite all the Church of Ranja's work, horror stories still exist of the greed, decadence, and bloodlust corrupting the order from the time of its victory against the goblins in 220 FB until its destruction by the emperor priests in 337 FB. Whether the theater knights succumbed to the archdemon Zarfai, or perhaps the nameless god, it's lost to history and does not seem to negatively affect the Bronyars their descendants' reputation. Perhaps unique, uniquely in their capital city of Festum, people pay no attention to the ancient stories about cruel goblins, and the third generation of goblins living in Festoon enjoys full burgers' rights. Manka Reba, the goblin's leader, wants to earn these rights for, another, for, ob, for other goblins in other cities as well. After the fall of the Shadowlands, the Bjornland began to return to the trade power it once was. While the traditional nobles rule as they see fit over their serfs and their lands, there is a growing exchange between the Free Alliance trade houses and the Norbard families, whose Kalesh Kaleshka's coaches carry goods to the most remote country regions. This exchange of violence on one hand and financial power on the other creates the first campaign conflict, nobles and traditionalists versus the Free Alliance and the Norbards. This conflict, along with the Bornland's involvement in the campaign against the Heptarch, Helmy Halfax lends power to the Alliance of Kor's sign, a new reinvigorated cult. In the past few decades, the small sect found support among the ruling families and it now seeks power in the area between the Bourne and Wallach rivers to get rid of snake worshippers and money bags and to revive old bloodthirsty traditions. The second campaign conflict has to do with the awakening of the of Bjornland. The primal powers of river and land reclaim what humans took and changes everywhere. Animals are uncharacteristically aggressive, and farmers are reporting ghostly images of past battles in their fields, and much, much more. The inhabitants try vainly to make sense of these events. Opinions abound, but few actual insights exist. Hundreds of Bor Bornean warriors sent on a pilgrimage by noble Marshal N Najesha of Lionsford are said to have met the soul of the land, received a mysterious seed, and planted it by the giant's castle of Firunin. Many viewed the mighty oak tree that sprang up a short time later as a signed land accepted the humans as its new rulers. But even the most popular heroes of the pilgrimage, the busy steward Juko of Elkanen and the impoverished Count Leonin of Elanu, do not know what future tasks the country will ask of the humans. The Alliance of Kor's sign and its allies used the Theater Knights' old knowledge to exploit the events surrounding the Awakening. The Order of the Ram leads expeditions to the Overalls. The scholars Themzar, Altazar, and Alwyn K. Nord Nordwinger study old goblin artifacts, and the witches surrounding Zelda of Ilmen Stone sense the building eldritch power and ruminate about it in their meetings. But Kungasula, who goes by the name Manka Riba in Festum is one step ahead of them all, as she has experienced, as she as she experienced a similar awakening, one thousand years ago. So that's the background. And we'll get into the adventures. 
The first adventure is an introduction to the Bornland with its peculiarities and special narrative atmosphere. In it, the heroes witness goblin magic, magic's eldritch power in the year 1039 FB, manifesting in a horrible drum ritual. They meet a pair of goblin lovers, get their first insights into the awakening and the alliance of course sign, and learn about some sympathizers' motivations. Tough negotiations between belligerent festumers and three Norbard families lead to a journey through the marches and the snowy red sickle mountains that culminates in a finale of steep cliffs, drum beats, and goblin caves. Let's see, Travagov Ravenwood says, This is my first grab bag read through. Radu, do you usually provide commentary or is it more like a live audiobook reading? Uh, so, excuse me, so I, um, a little, a little bit of both. Um, I, I provide commentary if I have it. Um, I read these as someone new to the um, new to the game and new to the history and the world. So um, I don't have a lot of um, I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge to kind of give background or stuff like that. But if something you know, uh, if something comes up that I recognize from my from the experience I do have, I I definitely comment it. Um, I'm also interested in hearing uh, what you guys uh, what your experiences are with with this adventure specifically. Um, and, um, uh, if you guys heard about the, uh, uh, the gods of Amaturia Kickstarter, um, so it's kind of generally a chat, but I also, um, uh, I also read through. And so in reading through, I'm hoping to kind of, you know, uh, get some knowledge myself plus to give you guys, um, um, you know, if you have a place to ask questions, uh, and if I can answer them, I will, if I can't answer them, I will go to someone who can, and, um, I might not be able to answer them, you know, this session, but uh, next next time I uh, do some more read through, we can answer them then after I get an answer. Um, and so so yeah, so this is uh, the reason I'm doing the theater nights is because uh, this is a six part adventure, and the first three parts are out in English, and the next three parts are coming with the Gods of Aventuria Kickstarter as well. So uh, that's why we're delving into this right now. And you know, I'll, I'll comment comment on things that that I understand about, but. There, one of the things that I've grown to to really appreciate with uh, with uh, the Dark Eye is just the depth of the lore. Like it just drips drips with lore, um, and so I expect that this campaign will um, give a lot. I mean, just, it's already you know um, already really interesting with the goblins and things like that. So <clears throat> let's see. So where did I start? So where did I stop? Um, Tough negotiations between belligerent festumers and three Norbard families lead to a journey through the marches and the snowy red sickle mountains that culminates in a finale of steep cliffs, drum beats, and goblin caves. Oh, by the way, there are there will be spoilers in this, so if you think you're going to be a, a player, you might not want to uh, might want not want to listen to this one. The campaign consists of six volumes altogether, along with some smaller scenarios covering the ruckus of Festum in the spring of 1038 FB, set six months prior to this adventure, through noble, noble Marshal's election in the winter of 1040 FB. The heroes travel and explore the Bornland's forests and swamps, the Red Sickle and Wall Mountains, the plains of Suaria, Suaria the Bourne and Wallach Rivers, Walsock Rivers, the Bornwood and many small villages, as well as larger cities such as Niers and Iberad, Firnin, Norberg, and Notmarch. With the aid of the theater knight's lost secrets, they also discover the mystery behind the awakening itself. They fight dragon riders, river pirates, evil cultists, and wild creatures until they solve the land's mystery and determine what fate has in store for its inhabitants. Let's read through this bonus content please visit ulysses.us for bonus downloadable content for the theater knights campaign including background information on the kingdom of bjornland the setting for this adventure and a glossary of common bjorn in terms hmm. let's go let's see i think i got a chrome there we go oh let's move it a bit I'm just going to shrink it down a little bit. All right, so let's go see what we have at the website. Oops. Mm. 
All right, let's see. Probably in the downloads, maybe. All right, so there's the Dark Guy character sheets, core rules, town and map for Revelations of Heaven. Here we go. Bonus reference material for the Theater Knights campaign, beginning with the White Lake. Here's the bonus material, so you can just, and there's bonus material, bonus archetypes for Warring Kingdoms, Tales of Dragons and Thieves game board. But let's check this out, the bonus material for the Theater Knights. So it looks like there is a uh, background reference material and glossy, glossary of Bjorn in terms. Nice, so just a, a little bit of extra material to kind of help you with the background. Uh, oh, so this is uh, like what happens when you make checks using um, using these different skills, and it kind of gives you um, the information that you can give to your players. Let me zoom in on it. Oops. Depending on what they what they roll, that's cool. So that's, that's a good amount of detail. Yeah. Law, myths, and legends. And then a glossary of Bjorn and terms. This is what I'm talking about. Like the, you know, the level of detail in these is is pretty amazing. Um, and I, I definitely appreciate this sort of content. Let's see. Trykov Ravenwood in the chat says, it was pretty intimidating when I first started with the Dark Guy. But I guess I really just needed to learn how the meta plot is dispersed through these longer adventures. And Planar Crossroads says, uh, you should see the old campaign style for 4.1. Those had 200 plus pages. <laughs> that can be overwhelming. Yeah, this is uh, broken down a little, a, a little more bite sized. It's not so intimidating. Um, like I said, it's 68 pages plus, you know, plus these this, these few pages with the this add on. But yeah, very cool. All right, so let's get back. All right. Appropriate heroes. Characters from the Boren land, especially those who care deeply about the country, are especially suitable, but this campaign is also of interest to Norbard, children of Bronars, Bron Bronyars, probably? Goblins, witches, and blessed ones of Rondra or Kor, since these heroes must confront other members of the communities. Goblins, Norbards, witches, and other exotic heroes should be bound early on to respectable personalities, such as priests or nobles, to enjoy some measure of safety in their wards. As as their wards. If your players are interested in such things, you can discuss concepts like serfdom and squiredom. The battles against the Alliance of Kor's sign require strong sword arms, and fighting professions usually take interest in the basic campaign motives of honor and tradition. There is no reason players cannot choose heroes from an old Bjorn and Noble house, though we caution against using characters from the Ask family in this campaign, for reasons that will become clear later. Rangers could shine in this campaign, and the heroes' long journeys leads through mountains, mountain ranges, dense forests, and treacherous swamps, often in unpleasant weather. Also, do not underestimate the value of skilled sailors on the Bjorn, Bjornland's waterways. Social heroes may do well with negotiations, research and interrogation situations which, in which sensitive aesthetics, ponderous politicians, or cultivated couriers would quickly reach their limit. The same goes for blessed ones, prepared to enforce their authority with violence if need be. Magically, magically gifted heroes, especially those who follow intuitive traditions, might experience the awakening of the Bornland more in intensely than their counterparts. In addition to witches and mages, Zibiljas, Zibil or goblin shamans, are especially appropriate for this campaign. Druids are rather rare, and few elves remain in the Bornland, but either would be appropriate as well. Scholars will be seen with suspicion among illiterates as rare as exotic birds. There are some magical phenomena for them to study. For them to study, but they won't have much to do in the campaign unless they are also interested in studying the awakening. The history of the theater knights, the Norbards, or the magic of goblins, Zibiljas, and witches. Geirders from southern Aventuria will suffer during the Bjorn in winter, while orcish heroes and those from barbaric cultures will not enjoy the Rondran populace. You should not use heroes in this campaign who are 
unaccustomed to the basic rules of peaceful coexistence or who would ignore concepts such as town, family, state, and property. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Hero motivation. The hero's employers in this adventure can use payment or sympathy to get them started in the campaign. If you want to give the heroes a deeper motivation, tie their backgrounds to the peaceful coexistence of the Middenrealmers, Norbards, and Goblins, the Bjornland's three great ethnicities. The heroes should be concerned with stability of these relationships as seen in the examples below and should rely on it because of their family, social standings, or convictions. The heroes are knights or warriors from the Bjornland, Horasian Empire, or the Midden Realm, who follow the glorious heritage of the theater knights and want to protect the faithful from their, uh, from the threat of dark powers. The heroes are Norbards, or goblins, whether traitors or rat catchers who do not consider the Bjornar suppressors or enemies. The heroes are all urban characters, blessed ones of Hisindi, scholars, or members of merchant families who value free trade and hold few prejudices. The heroes are Bjorn and Spellcasters, studying the awakening of the Bjornland and its effects on the inhabitants. Some heroes have prejudices against a certain group, but their prejudices should not be strong enough to make cooperation impossible. So, you know, the, this gives you a few um, different kind of groups. If you want to have a group that has uh, kind of a common purpose, this gives you four examples of ones you could have. Uh, and I like how they kind of tell you ahead of time and because it's never fun to kind of play an adventure you know you're like oh, i got a barbarian but there's no fights in this adventure or you know i've got a uh, a really social character but there's all fights in this adventure so it's nice that they kind of um give you those options tell you kind of what's coming up you know like you can play an elf but there might not be a whole lot of kind of extra stuff for you to do or stuff that's specifically tied to you which makes sense a second motivation, motivating factor for the heroes can be the awakening itself. In addition to everything mentioned above, the awakening might affect the hero's homes, property, or futures, and they want to find out what's happening. Examples can include a hero's home village becoming overgrown, trouble with family farm, mysterious findings at the family gravesite, spontaneous ensoulment of a precious family heirloom, and so on. A green leaf symbol marks these scenes affected by the awakening. Nice. I really like... Uh, I don't think I've seen... A whole lot of that um you know putting symbols like this in the in the books i really like that let's see Tycho said uh try what is it trikoff trikoff said yeah elves tend to walk away with things and not understand the term of property and it's also nice to note that most adventures are pretty well rounded between social and combat conflicts yeah if you missed uh, earlier on the back of the adventure let's see rather than going through on the back of the adventure here uh, it shows like how much combat and social stuff is in this adventure, which is cool. I like that. The Atma At Atmascot Parade. From 925 to 928 FB, Atmascot Blood Drinker, the Thorwaller, occupied Festum's warehouse island and blockaded the kingdom's most important trade harbor. The city guard finally managed to apprehend the pirate and angry Festumers skinned Adamask before he was drawn and quartered and used his skin to make the Thorwall drum. The restoration of the warehouse island was accompanied by the beats of, his drum, of this drum. Thus, the tradition of the At Atmascot parade began. Every year on the 8th of Fex, the longshoremen carry straw effigies called Atmascotias throughout the tr streets of the warehouse island. Recently, the campaign against the heptarch Helmi Hafax, and the subsequent rise of patriotic feeling has caused the event to expand. And in Fex 1038 FB, the parade marched through half the city and ended with a symbolic quartering of the largest at Moscotier Mos in the Great Market. The traditional burgers celebrated, but, the many groups, but many groups did not approve the open hatred against strangers presented so candidly. Protests from goblins, norbards, and scholars from the Hasindi village were ignored, as usual, and the beating of the drum resulted in riots and the confrontations between the city guard and the exiled Moroscans, young norbards, and angry, angry Thorwallers. The public is unaware that the awakening fed their emotions. Members of the council, whose previous worries were ignored, quickly demanded the parades be abolished. However, members of the city guard, the guilds, the newly wealthy, and the faithful of Rondra joined together to insist the parade tradition continue. 
in its current form. Soon the Grand Council, Festum's town council, was at a deadlock. The final decision, just as many other more important decisions, delayed. That's a that's a pretty grim uh, grim beginning and grim history of that of the Thorwald drum, but it's really interesting. I, I like the um, you know talking about the parade and how it gives different there's sort of different angles that different uh, characters could have depending on their background. I like that. The Thorwald drum, much like a common guard drum, this drum's corpus has a closer lower end and one and one skin stretched over the opening. The drum head actually is made of of Atmoscot blood drinker skin. The circumstances surrounding its creation are still visible as the makers paid no attention to artifice and blackened shreds still hang down the edges. The corpus was given a new coat of red paint for this for the parade. Because an enemy's skin was used to cover the drum as part of a brutal revenge campaign, it's perfectly suited for use in a ritual meant to stir rage and bloodlust. <laughs> nice. The drum's purchase. The drum ended up at the Sergilov trading house via a plot between the former noble marshal Juko of Dalathin and Persenzig. It was to be bought directly sorry, it was to be bought brought discreetly to the Hardener Speckles, where three Norbard families live on their houseboats, safe from the hostilities of nearby Bjornars. However, despite all secrecy, an anonymous tip concerning the whereabouts of the drum found its way to the city guard. Captain Elkman Timsky decided to try to retrieve this patriotic symbol to eliminate the shame of having it lost in the first place. Recent Weeks In the autumn of 1039 FB, before the lakes of the speckles freeze over, Captain Timsky organizes a campaign. He plans to purchase the drum using donations from wealthy festumers or else reclaim it by force with an armed group of supporters. If necessary, the wealthy prince, Prince Juiced of Salderseed, has agreed to back Timsky. He is willing to protect the drum in his castle and have it brought from Festum to the parade every year. Both the captain and the prince believe reclaiming the drum will both garner them prestige and silence their enemies in the ground council. So this was one of those symbols that I think said it meant um, that these were sort of important events. Meanwhile, military matters are underway in the Bjornland. Lingen of Illinu gathers supporters for a campaign against Tobrian to defeat Helmi Halfax and his followers. At the winter's end, the most honorable Bronars of the Bronyars of the March and the Festernland set out from their estates, creating a power vacuum that gives the Alliance of Kor's sign a chance to take control. Planning ahead, the Alliance infiltrates many noble houses and strengthens traditional traditional social trends such as Timsky's campaign. The Norbards of the Speckles are the Alliance's perfect scapegoats, much like the Sergilofs are a prime example of the miserable money bags of the Free Alliance who would steal a decent man's last shirt. An escalation in the Speckles could create an important precedent to allow nobles to deal more roughly with traitors and Norbrands in the future. Nice. Again, I, I, I just like how there's there seems to be a lot of different angles where people are coming um, coming to these events from. It kind of automatically puts conflict in, in the game. Very cool. Johnny and Brutish. Arguments about the Thorwald drum also dominate conversations in Hasinde's village, Festum's scholarly center. A society of non-disbelievers organizes, organizes regular thoughtful gatherings, inviting goblins to participate. These attempts at interracial understanding eventually bring forth the Red Choir. Two young goblins regularly attend these events. Brooch, the brave rat catcher, and Johnny, the goblin sorceress, Manka Reba's promising student. During Venus celebrations with song and poems about chivalry and love, as well as a deep fascination with horror stories and dark occultism, the undying love of these two goblins grows, as does their friendship with Oko Nak, a young mage. However, as goblins do not tolerate alcohol well, Janine makes a horrible mistake about two weeks before the heroes begin their adventure. While drunk, she blurts out secrets, which Oko carelessly writes down in, in his vad, vademic, vademicum. Um, among them, hints about Orvai's Kurum's war drum, a ritual that can instill bloodlust in warriors via the beating of a drum. 
Ruefully, Johnny admits her mistake to her teacher, and as punishment is ordered to spend three years in the Red Sickle with the goblin sorceress Trinun, Trinun Stonetooth of the Lungai Thelzu tribe, hopefully learning to appreciate the privileges of life in Festum. Manka Reba's trustworthy servant, Pronwart, a goblin tanner journeyman, will accompany the young sorceress on her trip to the Red Sickle. However, Brooch does not want his beloved to leave and follows them. In the fairy village of ha Hamkeln, they run afoul of Jerusalem, of Sheriandale. Crabwitko? Whoa, that's a hard one. Crabwitzkoj? Who wants to join Tombinsky's band? The three insist on their burgers' rights, but such but such is a goblin's life. They are mocked and taken captive. Pronward escapes, but Johnny and Brooch suffer the noble's cruel capriciousness. In Festum, Pron Pronward turns to Olka, who immediately decides to save his friends. Adventure Overview Their recruiter hires the heroes to peacefully resolve the negotiations between Timsky's men and the Norbards of the Speckles. Oko also seeks their help to free Johnny and Brooch. On their journey to Harden, the heroes experience winter in the Bjornland. They witness the theater knight's traditions being kept alive in places they visit, and notice strange events caused by the awakening of the Bjornland. When they reach the Speckles, the situation seems complicated at first, and everything points to an eventual armed conflict between the Festumers and the Norbards. The heroes must first earn the Norvard's trust, then craft an agreement over the drum's price, all the while avoiding several attacks. They can also try to free the enslaved goblins, but not before the goblins try to use the Thorwall drum to take revenge against their torturers. Using the Orvai's Kurm to war drum ritual, they bring the negotiation to a violent and bloody conclusion and escape into the Red Sickle. The heroes, along with Tominka, Trebritsky, the Zibilja, and Lur. Ludara of Furinin, the Blessed One of Rondra, pursue the goblins into the mountains, where they must deal with trolls, snow wild beasts, snow wild beasts, and the goblins of Trimian's tribe, Trinun's tribe. They find the fleeing goblins in the tribe's home cave, but experience the ritual, the drum ritual's effects a second time. The awakening in the game. The awakening is a decades-long process, so reveal its secrets to your players carefully. In game, the heroes will witness several events with similarities. The first signs of the awakening. Old mystical natural forces of the land, plants, or magical creatures make themselves known to the human-dominated world. In addition to this mystical trait, we call it primal. The effects caused by the awakening have the following in common. Wherever the awakening rears its head, one sees faces, shapes appear in the tree bark, patterns in mosses, nicks in old masonry, tracks in the snow, ripples in the water, and rust on metal. Sometimes the faces are vague, sometimes they are clear, and in rare instances they are accompanied by a far-off whisper. The awakening is always connected to rage. We describe rage as any human, animal, or other mortal being's destructive emotions, everything from sleeplessness to helpless de desperation to aggression to burning hatred. In the march, the heroes experience the effects of the awakening several times. We indicate scenes affected by the awakening with a green leaf symbol for easy reference. A detailed description of the awakening's background follows in a later adventure. The heroes should begin to grasp the pattern of primal events, faces, and rage around the end of the second campaign adventure. Using magical or karmic powers, some events can be traced to awakened spirits of the dead or fleeting arcane surges. But there are no such ex explanations for the changes in nature. Nothing but a spontaneous gathering of elemental power. Nice. I like, I like that. I mean, it, it, you know, there's something going on in the background that uh, that is not going to come up directly. Um, you know, the results or the 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 reasons for for the awakening are not going to come up directly here but the effects of the awakening will be seen um and you know that's cool so it kind of is laying those seeds so that later when people learn of the awakening and um and learn what it means they're like oh you know we we saw evidence of that a long time ago so it will tie characters in um so i, I like that a lot the magical drumheads Many legends exist about the goblin Timbal, 
Some speak of a powerful war drum made of goblin or human skin, which gives boundless strength to warriors. Others speak of uncontrolled elemental power, and still others believe it reveals a hidden path over the Iron Edge. These legends are all true in their own way, but before the heroes ever see their first goblin tremble, they will likely learn about the special goblinoid magic that results when it is beat. Only a few of Kungasula's chosen students are aware of the magic. So the Orvai Kurum's war drum, an add-on rule. A ritual for causing bloodlust in which goblin sorcerers paint images of boars and spears on a drum head with a paint made of ochre and blood, and then beats the drum. Check is int, dex, and con, and the effect. The sound of the drum causes bloodlust in members of the race whose skin was used to create the drum head. Without a successful willpower, resist threats, check, with a penalty equal to the ritual's quality level, all appropriate intelligent creatures or animals suffer the state bloodlust. See the core rules, page 35. The effect radius is 16 yards. Beating the drum takes one action. The bloodlust lasts 2d20 plus quality level combat rounds. The ritual takes 30 minutes. The AE cost, that's arcane energy, is 16. Range is touch. Duration is quality level times 3 in days. Target category is mundane objects. Property, object, traditions, goblin, and sorceress. And improvement costs the... Interesting. Get the bloodlust. I wonder... Let's see. I think there is a... Uh, let's see if we can find this quickly. I'll go back over here and I'm looking up for it. So the dark eye conditions bloodlust. See what we can find here. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. I think there was a uh the like the rules re reference. There's a, a wiki that's got all of the um, all of the dark eye stuff on it, and it looks like here. Let me change the size of this so you can see it a little easier. Wrong one. So this this is the the dark eyes rules wiki. It's at um, it's at uh, ulysses-regalwiki.de. Put that in the chat. So let's see. We wanted to look up uh, bloodlust. Let's see what comes up. Blood rush, rabies, frenzy. Hmm. Not seeing it in here. That was right, right? Bloodlust is what it said. Let's see, the state bloodlust. See the core rules, page 35. It's blood rush. Uh, so let's see if we can find this over here somewhere. Hmm. States, yeah, let's look up states. Oops. <clears throat> let's see if this one's on here. Uh, it looks like it's on in here. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> where is my main book? Blood Rush is Bloodlust. Oh, interesting. Okay, same thing. Thanks, Planar Crossroads. So let's see. Blood Rush. Starting on the next combat round after entering the state, the hero gains uh, plus four t bonus to attack. Uh, let me resize this so you guys can see that I guess I can just go like this uh, plus four bonus to attacks plus two bonus to damage and a plus two bonus to feet of strength checks in addition the hero ignores the effects of the condition pain however the hero may no longer defend engage in ranged combat or use skills other than physical skills and intimidation or use special combat abilities other than forceful blow the GM secretly rolls 2d20 to determine the duration of the bloodlust in combat rounds. Duration this time, 
During this time, the hero attacks enemies, but when all enemies are disabled, the hero attacks the next closest person, be it a friend, an innocent bystander, a city guard, or even the Empress Rahaja herself. If no one is near, the hero goes on a rampage in search of targets. When Bloodlust ends, the hero gains two levels of the conditioned stupor. Nice. That's pretty cool. Um... All right. The road to the adventure. So this looks like, so this is, you know, this was kind of a, a bunch of background and introduction that we, um, that we've kind of gone over. And I think um, since this next part looks like, uh, the, you know, is where it really kind of gets into the adventure. Yeah. So in this segment, the adventure of the adventure, the heroes meet a mage named Olko Oko Nak and travel to the Hardener Lake District during the onset of winter. Along the way, they experience some effects of the awakening and find their first clues about the machinations of the Alliance of Course Sign. By the end, they should have achieved the following. So this is kind of where the adventure gets into it um, in full. That's a pretty cool image. So I think we're going to call it there for, for the day. We've been going about 45 minutes. And uh, I think now we have a, a good overview of what this adventure is going to look like, um, uh, at least, you know, broad terms. Um, and I think the, the background sounds really interesting. You know, it has a lot to do with goblins and talks about how uh, it seems to have some, um, you know, some differences from a lot of a lot of games, like how they treat their goblins. Uh, in some aspects, they're still sort of seen as... Um, you know, monstrous humans, humanoids, but in other aspects, they're sort of part of society, which is interesting. So um, I, I will, I think I'm going to enjoy reading that aspect of it as well as, you know, getting all this, the history of the theater nights, the fact that they're sort of not really around anymore, but their traditions are still hauled up is really cool. So I think this adventure looks like it's going to be going to be a lot of fun. So come back. Um, let's see, today is, uh, let's say today's Friday. So come back on Monday and we'll read the next part of this. So Monday at 11 AM, uh, Pacific time. And we'll, we'll really get into, uh, into the adventure and what the player characters are going to do. All right. So until then, um, we'll see you around.